prototypes and in samples or examples if you prefer. Types and examples are used to convey a message on a deeper level than the literal of how it looks in English. They are guides, they are paths to follow, they tell us how we should act. We look to the past so that we can learn and be ready for the future, especially in our Father's Word. Let's consider some types and examples and symbologies. First, let's consider the symbology of unleavened bread. This is flat bread, which doesn't rise because it has no leaven or yeast. But it sustains the body. The Israelites ate unleavened bread, and unleavened bread is still used today for communion. It is symbolic of the body of Christ, which was broken for our sins, and which also sustains the body of Christ, His Word. So too, the wine of communion is symbolic of Christ's blood, which was shed for our sins, and it's symbolic of the fruit of the vine of which Christ is. And His blood cleanses us from sin. Now, leavened bread, as I said, was eaten by Israel. Unleavened bread was poor man's bread eaten by Israel since the captivity of Egypt when they were slaves. But it has a deeper connotation and meaning. You'll recall in the New Testament plenty of places, Jesus Christ said, Beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees. How many times did Jesus reiterate this warning? Many times, in fact. But what is the leaven he was speaking of? Again, we know from the Bible that leaven is yeast. Yeast which makes dough rise. When Christ said, Beware of the, scribe, the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, though, what was he referring to? He sure was not talking about a recipe for making bread, for Jesus is the bread of life. No, he was referring to the doctrine and the teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he put it in such a way that we could get the message. Because we know that when yeast is applied to dough, the yeast will make the dough rise. And it only takes a very small amount of yeast to make a large amount of dough rise. In other words, if you put just a tiny amount of yeast into dough or a dough loaf, the yeast will saturate it and go all the way through it and cause it to rise. The point being that it doesn't take very much false doctrine or false teaching to enter into the church or into the faithful to pull them off track and deceive and mislead them. But if you'd like some more proof, turn with me to the book of St. Matthew, chapter 16 and verse 6. And we'll be, we will begin reading of this leaven. <coughs> verse 6. And Jesus said unto them, Take heed, and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Verse 7. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Verse 8. Which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because you have brought no bread? Verse 9. Do ye not remember the five thousand... Or, or do you not remember the five loaves of the five thousand, and how many baskets you took up? Verse 10. Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets you took up? Verse 11. How, it is you do, how is it you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Verse 12. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Okay, now we have just clarified is this as to what the leaven Jesus was speaking of is. But again, it was put into a term that you can understand because we still use leaven this day, or yeast, to make bread rise. We can see a deeper meaning in this type, in this example. 
Now false doctrine is prevalent in many churches today. You have those who put on fake healing shows to draw people in, in and raise money. You have those that dance with snakes and drink poison. You have those that put on telephones and say, Oh, the Lord's going to be angry if we don't raise a million dollars. Because they believe in their twisted logic that they are helping God out. Or, again, they do it to draw people in and raise money. But all they are doing is bringing people into their church, which is a house of emptiness where there is only a marginal amount of truth. Let's look at another type in symbology, another example. During the time when the Israelites were still slaves in Egypt, God sent Moses to Pharaoh to petition Pharaoh for the release of Israel from bondage. Now there are several types in this example. First of all, Pharaoh is a type of the devil who has many in bondage. Secondly, the types of the ten plagues as signs unto Pharaoh into Egypt, which are as the signs of the times which were spoken of by Jesus and the plagues of the book of Revelation. And when God sent the death angel to Egypt to free Israel, God told Moses, have the Israelites slaughter a lamb for each family and put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of the house. This lamb's blood is symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ, for Jesus is called the lamb slain. It was, symbol it was a symbolic act to guide us as to what would, ha would come. And the death angel passed over the houses with the lamb's blood on the doorposts and killed only the firstborn of Egypt or those who had not the blood of the lamb on their doorposts. Again, this is symbolic of Christ's blood and Christ's truth protecting us from Satan. And as this happened, the Israelites ate unleavened bread at that first Passover. And it's called Passover because the death angel passed over and again, the death angel is symbolic of Satan. Passover is still commemorated and celebrated to this day. And it's called Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Many call it Easter now, but it's still the same day. Now let's consider another type. When God told Abraham to take his son, uh, to take Isaac, his only begotten son, up to Mount Moriah, and sacrifice him upon the altar, this was a type. Actually, it was also several types. First of all, Abraham means father of many nations, and he is a type or, or example of God who would sacrifice his only begotten son. But God stopped Abraham from sacrificing Isaac and replaced Isaac on the altar with a lamb. Again, symbolic of the lamb slain and how Jesus took our place and was sacrificed for our sins and died upon the cross. The Bible is filled with these kinds of types and symbologies, such as when the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees told Christ, we would see a sign of thee. Jesus said, a wicked and perverse generation seeketh after a sign, but there shall be no sign given them save of that of Jonas the prophet. Now what is this symbology? Well of course, Jonas the prophet was Jonah of the story of Jonah and the whale. And in this type, Jonah was given as a type of Christ. Because Jonah was swallowed by the whale as when Jesus was swallowed up by death upon the cross, and then Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days, just as Jesus was in the tomb for three days. Then after those three days, Jonah was vomited out onto the shore, where the people called the Ninevites who worshipped the fish god saw him and were converted. Just as when Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus who is also symbolic of the fish, when Jesus rose, it began Christianity. And Christianity is the way to God. So many people were converted. Because Jesus defeated death when he died for our sins and resurrected. Now, other things in the life of Jesus. 
that are symbologies, that are types. When Jesus made the blind to see and healed the sick and raised the dead, these were also signs and symbologies and types. Types that God's Word, which Jesus is, Jesus is the living Word, opens eyes, opens ears, raises the spiritually dead souls so that they can have eternal life. In other words, so that they are no longer mortal souls, mortal meaning liable to die, but become eternal souls. For the next example, we're going to do some reading in Scripture. We're going to go and read the verses which tell of Jesus' crucifixion and how it synchronizes with a prophecy given almost a thousand years earlier. The prophecy of David in chapter 22 of the book of Psalms. So let's go to the book of St. Matthew and read the words and the story of Jesus upon the cross. And we will begin with Matthew chapter 27 and verse 30. And then we will go to Psalms 22 and see how it correlates. And verse 30 reads, And they spit upon him, and they took the reed and smote him on the head. Verse 31, And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, and put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. Verse 32, And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and compelled him to bear his cross. Verse 33. And when they were come up, and when they were come into that place called Golgotha, that is to say the place of the skull, verse 34, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. Verse 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. Again, this is straight out of Psalms 22. Verse 36, And sitting down they watched him there. Verse 37, And over his head the accusation written, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Verse 38, then there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and one on the left. Verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. Verse 40. And saying, That thou destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Verse 41. Likewise the chief priest mocking him with the scribes and the elders said, Verse 42. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come now down from the cross, and we will believe him. Verse 43. He trusted on God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Verse 44. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same into his teeth. Verse 45. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. Verse 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama shebathne. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? 47. Some of them that stood there, when they heard this, said, This man calleth for Elias. Verse 48. And straightway run, one ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it upon a reed and gave to him to drink. <coughs> Verse 49. And the rest said, Let be. Let us see if Elias will come and save him. Verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Which means, of course, he passed on. <coughs> now we just read the events of the crucifixion of Jesus. And how Jesus said, My God, my God, thou, why hast thou forsaken me? And the events that were going on around his crucifixion. And many people believe that when God said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That he was addressing God. But, Jesus never once called his Father God. He always called him Father. So, 
Do these words have another meaning, a deeper context, a type or an example? Let's go to the book of Psalms, the Psalms of David in chapter 22. And we will see that Jesus was actually speaking these words with a purpose, and not because he thought God had forsaken him. But the purpose he spoke them was to allow every one of those at that time, and quite frankly our time, to see that this was a prophecy of David in Psalms 22, and that it was coming to pass right before their eyes. Let's go there now and read it, that we may understand. It was a historical event or type from the Old Testament coming to pass as an actual happening in the personage of Jesus Christ and the end of his life in the flesh. And Jesus Christ, of course, his life is the New Testament. So, Psalms 22 and verse 1, and it reads, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Verse 2, O God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. Verse 3, But thou art holy, thou art that that inhabitest the praise of Israel. Verse 4, Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. Verse 5, They cried unto thee, and were delivered, they trusted in thee, and were not confounded which means confused. Verse 6, But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Verse 7, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip and shake their head, saying, Verse 8, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Verse 9, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me to hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. Verse 10. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. And as you know, there was none to help Jesus. He was all alone hanging upon that cross, except for the two malefactors, which is also another prophecy. Verse 12, Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me all around. Bulls of Bashan, of course, are a type of an unstoppable force because of their strength. Verse 13, They gassed upon me with their mouths as, ravening, as a ravening and a roaring lion. Verse 14, I am poured out like water, all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax and is melted in the midst of my bowels. I want you to think about that verse. I am poured out like water. He was bleeding to death on the cross. My bones are out of joint. Of course, he was hanging on that cross. And of course, the cross and gravity working against each other to pull his arms out of socket. And his legs. Verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me to the dust of death. And here we go again. My tongue is dried up. If you recall in several Gospels it's written that Christ said, I thirst. But he would not drink of the fruit of the vine again until he drank it with all in his kingdom. And that's why he would not partake of the vinegar and the gall. Verse 16. For dogs have compassed me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Verse 17. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. Verse 18. They part my garments and cast lots upon my vesture. Verse 19. Be thou not far from me, O Lord, my strength. Haste thee to help me. Now we're going to stop there for that particular chapter. Now, you should be able to see the symbology there. If you cannot, go and read all four Gospels and the read the words spoken at the crucifixion. Because each of the four Gospels is a separate witness and some of them recorded events which are not listed in the other Gospels. But just as a footnote, 
Jesus was crucified at Golgotha, which is almost exactly at Mount Moriah, where Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice to him, and where Isaac was replaced on the altar by the Lamb, which is symbolic of Jesus Christ. You will see, just as I said, that this was a happen, happening in history and a replay or a re-example of the type. In other words, that which has happened will happen again. Not exactly, but in a type so that you can understand it. And that's how our Father works. He gives us types that we can understand and learn from. So, again, the Bible is full of such examples, which are at times called insamples. And insamples is an old Anglo word which means examples or samples of. Examples like Pharaoh, the king of Babylon, and the king of Assyria, which are all types of Satan and how Satan brings captivity upon the faithful, which again, they brought faithful upon Israel, which at the time was the church. And prophets like Jeremiah, who warned of the captivity. Yet Zedekiah, the king of Israel, hearkened not to God or to God's messenger, but sought the counsel of his seers and diviners, and sought a way to avoid the captivity, even though God had said, you are going into captivity. And so God allowed uh, King Zedekiah to be captured, and to have his eye, male heirs killed, and his eyes gouged out, which is symbolic that he had no eyes to see, and that he had no ears to hear, because he didn't hearken to God. And so he was taken into captivity. And again, Babylon as in King of Babylon, and the place where this happened, besides its geographic name for the city, also means confusion. From the Tower of Babel, where God struck the men down that were trying to make their own way to salvation, and gave them all different languages so that they couldn't understand each other. And that is where the prime root of the word Babel comes from. It means confusion. Which is to say, the king of Babylon is the king of confusion. And the king of Babylon, of course in the bigger picture, is Satan, who deceives people in ignorance and in confusion and in the confusion of God's word. And all these things happened historically. But they are types and examples and symbologies for us to follow. And they are examples to us that not listening to God and His Word will allow us to be fooled in confusion, confusion of religion, and those who claim to be religious but are ignorant to God's Word, or who are ignorant to God's Word. And many of them look holy. Many of them wear priest robes. So the only way to know is for us to study for ourselves and read our Father's Word. There are even examples in the Bible in places we don't suspect. Like when Moses was told by God to speak to the rock in the desert. And that if he did speak to the rock, it would bring forth water for all to drink and not thirst. But Moses, under pressure from a bunch of whining and complaining Israelites, struck the rock. Even so, it brought forth water. But the rock is and was symbolic of Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus told the woman at the well, Drink from this water and ye shall never thirst again. Just as that, the rock from the desert, which Moses struck, sustained the Israelites in the dry and gave them water to drink so that they could rehydrate themselves. After all, the desert is a hot, arid place. But because Moses struck the rock, God stopped him at Mount Nebo and did not let her, him enter into the promised land. Now many will say that the rock that Moses struck wasn't symbolic of the Lord. Because Moses didn't know Jesus, and he sure didn't know that Jesus would come to be known as the rock. Well, it's, that's true in as much as Jesus had not come in the flesh yet. But read Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses, and you might feel differently. And let's not forget what happened after God freed Israel from Egypt. Moses took them to Mount Sinai. And when Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments, he was gone for 40 days. 40, of course, is symbolic of probation. And while Moses was up on Sinai, Israel got antsy and rebelled. 
because they were now free. They had been given too much freedom too quickly. And so they turned on God and started to worship false idols. Even after they had witnessed with their own eyes, God freed them with the plagues of Egypt, and God opening the Red Sea before them, and God keeping a cloud over them in the daytime in the desert, and a pillar of fire by night, and feeding them with manna, and giving them water, and, and uh, pheasants to eat. After all this, they turned their back on him. And this angered God, and he killed many of them by opening up the earth to swallow them. And the rest he made wander in the desert for forty years. Forty, again, symbolic of probation. Until that generation had all died off. Now as you consider that, think of how this nation, the United States, was born. The Constitution written from God's Word. Our liberties and freedoms we hold dear due to the sufferings of the past, such as Israel, and guaranteed by God. Yet today, many turn their backs on God and turn their backs on His Word and become secular and put man's wisdom before God's. They even draft laws to protect perversion so that God's Word isn't even allowed to be taught against those perversions. And God's Word has been taken out of the schools. It's not even allowed to be taught. Evolution, a teaching of man and man's wisdom, is taught, and creation is prohibited. Prayer in school has been removed, and sex education is taught, even alternative sex and alternative lifestyles, which God has expressly forbidden. Do you see a correlation here? A type? Do you see an example? And let's go back to Moses for a minute here. In the transfer of leadership from Moses to Joshua, there is another type. Because God gave Moses the law to give to Israel. That is why it's called the Mosaic Law and why Moses is called the lawgiver. And Moses represents a type of the Old Testament. And Moses stopped short of entering the Promised Land. And Joshua took over and led the people into the Promised Land. This is a type of the Old Testament giving way to the New and the Old Laws which Moses gave which called for the slaughter of animals and the sprinkling of blood to be replaced by the blood of Jesus Christ who was the sacrifice for one and all times and who became our salvation and our rest. And of course Jesus' salvation lets us enter into the promised land of eternal life. In fact, the name Jesus when spoken in Hebrew is Yahshua. And the name Joshua, when spoken in Hebrew, is also Yahshua, for there are no J's in Hebrew. So again, God has given us all sorts of types and signs and examples and symbologies to help guide us to the truth and the true matter of his word. Deeper levels of understanding, which many miss due to not studying for themselves or taking the word of their good dear pasture without looking for themselves. They take it as an English-only understanding. And that takes me to my next point. During the time when Jesus walked upon the earth, the church at his time was corrupt. Just as many nowadays are corrupt, with false doctrine, money-making schemes, and a general lack of the truth of God's word. The church at that time was so misled till they didn't even recognize the Son of God when he came to them, even after it was written how he would come in his word. And instead of listening to him, they sought to kill him and eventually did bring about his death. Even when given the choice by Rome of Jesus, the Son of God, a man who had done nothing wrong, or Barabbas, a murderer, they shouted for Barabbas. I want you to think about that. They chose a murderer over the Son of God, the God that they claimed to know and worship and teach but actually they were too busy playing church and bringing in money so they missed the truth and chose unwisely. The same is true of today. Many churches are filled with false doctrine and teach falsehoods which will lead the majority to fall and worship the wrong Christ. It will happen again. Once again man will err and make the wrong choice. And just as those who saw the truth in their time, such as Jeremiah 
and in the New Testament, John the Baptist. There are those today with the truth who are sounding the warning, but many don't take heed. Which choice will you make? Will you, chuddy, uh, will you cho uh, choose to study to show yourself approved? Or will you take the word of your dear smiling pasture and not read for yourself? Better think that one over real carefully. Now let's look and talk about some uh, symbology in the Bible for a moment that is not necessarily typish, but is more straight symbology. And because the writer had no other way to describe it than the symbology he knew in those times, that's how he penned it. And that can trip people up today, the modern reader if you will, if they aren't careful and you don't use common sense. When we read in the book of Revelation we see many symbologies. Symbologies that aren't literal. You have to discern in those symbologies and see what they correspond to so that you can understand the true method, uh, message. As an example, let's consider the beasts of the book of Revelation. Now when we read in the book of Le uh, Revelation, we will see in Revelation 13.1 it says, I looked and stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now we know this is not a literal beast, like a mythical fire-breathing dragon or such, but rather that it is a terminology. And if you read on further in the book of Revelation, it will explain that the sea is symbolic of the people of the world. And the symbology of the seven-headed beast won't be explained to that level, but since we know it comes from the people, it is symbolic of the seven continents of the world. Meaning, a seven uh, continent, one world system rising up with ten horns, and the horns are in the Bible, of course, are symbolic of power or of looks, and ten powerful, or uh, or the ten most the ten horns symbolize the most powerful ten nations, and the ten crowns symbolize their ten leaders, and written on them the name of blasphemy, because it's also written in the book of Revelation, the whole world shall wander after the beast, which is to say the one world system with the Antichrist, the false Christ, as their leader or the head. And many do not know this because many believe we're just going to fly away and that we're going to miss all that. But that's not what Jesus said. That too, this belief that you're going to fly away and you don't have to worry about any of this is false doctrine taught by those who are ignorant of types and examples and the truth of God's word and who do not know how to rightly divide God's word or check into the old languages. It is even written also in Revelation that this Antichrist comes with two horns as a lamb, but he spake as a dragon. This is another example of symbology. In this instance, it means he looks like Jesus the lamb, but he speaks lies as Satan, and his lies are to fool the world into thinking he is Jesus. But he is the Antichrist, which is Satan, just as written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He enters into the temple of God and exalts himself and claims that he is God. He exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worshipped, even showing himself that he is God. To understand these things, you must learn symbologies. You must learn to rightly divide the Bible and learn to see types and examples that God has given us in the past. You have to study and you have to be a watchman and know the voice of the true shepherd. And you had better know exactly who your Lord and Savior is and how your Lord and Savior said he would return because many just think it's going to happen at any moment. And he sent us messengers from the prophets of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Gospels and Paul, as well as others. And you better check yourself out or you could find you could find yourself praying for the mountains to fall on you because you were harvested 
out of season as an untimely fig, which means at the wrong time. You better look at these types and examples and symbolisms and make sure that you stand upon solid ground. You better make sure to see that your wall is daubed not with untempered mortar but with tempered mortar. And you better know your fathers well enough that you won't be deceived because once again we are going into captivity to a new king of Babylon. And it is because of Babylon or confusion that people are going to fall and worship him. And because of false doctrine and false teaching. It is my prayer that you won't fall and worship the wrong one. That you will dig into your father's word and learn it. And learn to rightly divide it and trace the old languages back. And make sure that you stand upon that solid ground. That you stand upon that rock. That you can have rest and have eternal life. Thank you for listening to this lecture. This has been Just Thoughts.